meal. Yeah. Is that I need to go home? Welcome to part five. As you all know, if you've seen part four, it, it sort of strangely ended on moments being brought up as car boot sales and films about plumbers to um, actual push on taps to um, Second World War and vabbing as well. I did not expect certain stuff coming out of my colleague's mouth about a certain incident what happens on this scene of this movie. Holy oh, shit, whoa, 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 what is this? It was so kind of like, or something. Why did you say that? I just thought that you were... Yes, it was strange when I heard my colleague commenting about, well, ladies' um, lack of dehydration or they need to be juice um, certain body fluids when he mentioned about his mum doing this in some war but obviously we are a different generation I just thought that you were drunk? yeah really drunk? fuck yeah well I'm not obviously we're all going through all these strange images because obviously what you adjusted and was saying but to get in the mind of the um, actress and the director of the um, promising young woman, I think we should stick to more interviews. That's good, isn't it? I think you should leave. Oh, may I leave? No. Oh, very sorry, I put the wrong clip on. But things are getting tense. It would be interesting to listen to Carrie Mulligan talking about her acting skills. Gosh, um, well, it's only really recently that we've started sort of getting in it because we, we, you know, we showed it in Sundance, which, which was amazing because we got to be in a room with people and it was so nice to be around people and we all miss that quite a lot now. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we got to sort of watch it with an audience and that was so fun and get to hear like a really vocal reaction. Um, but since then, we've just started doing press. But I think uh, my favourite um, reaction was sort of right at the beginning of the year when the film was going to come out, I did an interview with someone and they said, Oh my goodness, I loved this film, and my best friend hated it, and we had a massive fight. <laughs> Do you remember that, journalist? Um, and I thought that was so great. I was like, yes, that's the film I want to be in. Go and have a massive fight. So there's a little bit of Kerry Mulligan's reaction of some people watching Promising Young Woman. So you'd be wondering what Captain Pervert's um, reaction is on this scene. Oh. Maybe we'll leave. No, it's just really high. The movie got really interesting and tense, and he was quiet for a few seconds. Then he said something. It's like that movie, isn't it? What movie? That movie, you know, because he's on that um, devil um, um, talcum powder. Devil bear talcum powder. Yeah, it's about bear, you know, on powder, right? What are you comparing? Well, I'm not comparing the bear movie as such. I mean, there's another film, right? I'm that's like going in my head, but she's in a very dangerous situation, right? I know, I know he's like red mess, and obviously he's a bit, you know, eating the man word, right? But he could hire people because he's a villain. But the thing is, we all know he's a bit of a weedy nerd, isn't he? So well, he's, he's not much of a threat, is he? But what happened if it's like that um, other movie? What movie? That movie I showed you. But we don't know. You showed us quite a few movies. I don't want to watch this movie. Who are you babbling on about movies on a sudden? Yeah, but, right. Because, um, you know, I went on my phone, right? What? Yeah, yeah. Is that what you were quiet for? Well, yeah, you two were well, very quiet and you really liked watching this one, yeah. Right? Must have felt guilty or something, but yeah, I thought it was a good opportunity to put my phone on, right? And uh, find out what's going on about this movie because nobody's not really explaining what this movie's about. And then uh, you keep plenty of putting these interviews on, and I still haven't got a clue what the movie's about. But I have sort of figured it out. Wait on! 
So how did you find out what about this movie then? Well, obviously, you know, you know, I can easily wind the film back. Now, don't be doing that. No, well, I won't mind myself. You can sharp you. No, don't tell me to show up. Anyhow, you can't even read, so how do you know the information? Well, I've got my earpiece in, I? I watched somebody on YouTube about it. Do you know that they were comparing this movie like uh, another movie? What movie, then? Don't be spoiling it. I'm not spoiling it. Well, you are. You start telling me about it. I want to know what's happening in it normally. Yeah, but the thing is, though, I'm watching this YouTuber. What's well, explaining about this movie, right? Right. But we don't want to know. Well, I do, because uh, you ain't tell me what sort of film this is. Anyhow, what YouTuber are you watching? Well, I'm watching, the, I think it's the Yorkshire Critic. Critic? Yeah, right, the Yorkshire Critic uh, on, oh, yeah, it, it does movies, like, you now that alien movie. Right. Well, them, them xenomorphs or whatever. On, 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 he's done an um, episode of um, Star Wars, episode um, one and a half and three quarters. About, you know, that um, famous um, actor, you know, or, or, no, the character, um, Jar Jar Binks, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. Will you start trying to pay attention to your phone and concentrate what you're doing and talk to us? Well, I want to get back to the movie. Don't mind that, right, for the moment, yeah, right, this guy, right, he talked about that TV series and how, um, that famous one, you know, with the, um, the, uh, the ending, where everyone died, right, right, and, um, uh, yeah, it's, so, it's something to do with sex and all that, like, you know, you know, people don't die, they come back to life and have sex with their aunties and all that, lot. right, um, what is that, then? Well, now, what I want to talk about, what he's on about with this other movie, he's comparing with this one. Right. You're playing, like, um, interviews about, um, um, Carrie Mulligan, right? And, um, obviously, you know, um, there's a, you know, back in the old days, right? Even before I was born, right? I mean, obviously, the year after I was, but obviously. Yeah, there's a movie, right, that was made in England, done by a very famous American director at the time, right? And, um, well, there's some very interesting things about comparing this movie with this movie. But what? Well, you're wanting to play some of them interviews with the actress what's in this movie. And obviously, this guy, what the YouTube has mentioned, her acting. Because her times were different for the AD actresses. Well, then, now. I went down for my first meeting with Sam Peckinburn at Twickenham Studios. Now, I'd already shot a movie called Strange Affair with Michael York at Twickenham Studios. It wasn't a foreign place for me. I knew the studio well, I felt very comfortable going there again. I went up to the offices where I'd been many times before. And I went to Sam Peckinpah's office. Um, I there met for the very first time a lady who was to become a lifelong friend of mine called Katie Haber, who was his secretary at the time. And there she was sitting, typing outside and taking phone calls. And we said hello. And she said, I won't keep you a few moments and Sam's ready to see you. And I went in and saw him. There was a kindness to him that I thought was instantly recognisable, but there was also an aura around him, whether that was something I'd been told or something I felt, I don't know, but um, it, was, it was a pressure meeting him, I remember that. Um, it was quite terrifying. And he was lovely to me, but as I say, very confrontational. And we seemed to get on very well. It was a brief meeting, and when I left him, he said he would like to meet me again. So I knew that I was in for a second chance. <laughs> so it was interview after interview after interview. And each time he was testy, even more testy. Um, each time he was a little more personal. 
He tried to be very threatening and very frightening, but I wasn't frightened by him. I found him interesting, and um, I liked our meetings, and we had many, many, many meetings after that. Again, 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 I was called, must have been probably about six times. Now I went away on holiday, and on holiday, I got a call from my agent to say I was being called back to test. The script pages were sent, and when I got back from holiday, I read them, learned them, and went to Twickenham Studios to test. Sorry. And the worst part of all my all my meetings and the test and everything was after I had tested, because I knew now I'd put myself on the line. I knew now how badly I wanted this thing, how badly I wanted this role. It becomes as it does for every artist. At this point, it becomes a matter of life and death. Of course, it's not, but it feels that way. You know, it was so important. Are you sorry, sorry? I'm just sorry. Sorry, sorry. Pause now. A week goes by, and as I said, that was the toughest week of all. And then I was called back to the studio, and I wasn't told it was a, a final issue or that I was going to be cast. I was just told there was one more meeting still to be had. So I went along to Twickenham Studios. I walked in, Katie was my old friend by now, and I said, hi, how are you? <laughs> it's great to see you. And as I was talking to Katie, she was on the phone, and she was involved in a very, it seemed like a difficult conversation at the time and, and that she didn't really have time to talk to me so she sort of waved at me okay in a minute and, and continued with her conversation and as she was continuing with her conversation I noticed that the door to Peck and Pa's office was slightly ajar and I thought I wonder if I should go in or not or and she turned her back on me she spun around on the chair and turned her back on me which made it even more difficult. She was now on the phone, the door was slightly jar, and it appeared to me that there was also people talking in this room. So I sort of hedged towards the door, and I moved the door just a little to see if I could see in the room and see if anyone was expecting me. And there was a heated discussion going on, extremely heated. Three men and loud words and a lot of waving of arms. And I felt embarrassed. I was caught between a rock and a hard place. I was half in the door, half out. I didn't know whether I should now go in because I thought they'd, they were aware of my presence. But they didn't seem aware because they didn't stop talking and they didn't stop arguing, which I found extraordinary. So I stood in this sort of gap of the doorway watching these three men, three grown men, Dan Melnick, Sam Peckinpah and Dustin Hoffman, I realised is what it was, all having a heated discussion. So I hovered in the doorway, they paid no attention to me whatsoever, and they continued with this bout. I stood there for a few seconds, and I thought, they don't know I'm here. I mean, I, in my head, I went, they don't, they don't know I'm here. So I went back out the door, and as I did, I dropped my eye line. And as I dropped my eye line, I realized that these three men were standing with their trousers around their ankles. <laughs> Absolutely naked trousers round their ankles and I looked down and I thought oh god <laughs> and I looked up again and these three men burst into extraordinary laughter and looked at me and said welcome Amy and that was their way of telling me I mean obviously they wouldn't have done they wouldn't have performed such a rigorous joke and and you know had me arrive in this room if they weren't to give me this fantastic news that I, and it was actually Sam who said it, it wasn't Dan, it wasn't Dustin, they all stopped and Peck and Pye just looked at me and he said, welcome aboard Amy. And that's how they told me. So Captain Perfect, I don't actually understand the point what you're trying to get at by actually quoting this other movie now. Well, I put that interview on because she's a lot more clearer and compared to the actual director of your movie, isn't she? Well, well, look, the point is, Emerald for now is trying not to give the plot away. And this is the best thing about this movie, is not knowing. Well, I want to know, don't I? I mean, why can't she easily explain what's going on? Well, 
listen to what she really says and you'll pick up what she's meaning. Well, I think actually, weirdly, it doesn't seem to be gendered. I think, you know, we made a film that I, I hope was sort of as honest and kind of uh, complicated as these things generally tend to be. And so actually, you know, you find that, you find in general that the, that each person reacts to it in a, in a way that maybe isn't that expected. Um, but so I, I haven't, I personally haven't noticed that it's, that it's gendered um, particularly, but certainly, yeah, people don't, they don't respond always in the way that you anticipate. Establish you understood that. Well, obviously she's on about genders or whatever, other people are getting confused about how she talks about her own bloody movie. But the thing is, though, we may checking it out on the other YouTubers' opinions and stuff, that that YouTuber says this movie is a one and only, a actually a double R movie. A double R movie. Oh, yeah, to abbreviate it, yeah, to buy the first R. So, yes, it is a revenge movie, but it has that first R bit in it. Now, actually, Straw Dogs isn't a double R movie, because it leaves out the less R out. But I think it's wrong, because, obviously, they've left out about the revenge over a pussy, don't they? You what? A pussy. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, because the cat gets killed, doesn't it? Yeah, so you would go around killing people over your pet. Because other films have done that, haven't they? Well, yes. Why are you two babbling on about different type of movies for? Because that follows that typical stereotype. And this is why I think this young lady wrote a uh, script in it because she hasn't wrote a back about it there's no back wrote about this is there uh, no so obviously you know that the film was based on a book and obviously it was banned because some reason um, next year a TV series came out or a South because you remember the days that Yorkshire people were kicking off that they didn't want to watch Coronation Street because it was based in Lancashire and um, you know they're all big cry babies you know I mean they let the bleeding them Vikings take over and they lost the war against them um, Lancashire why are you getting out with that well the point is it's real facts isn't it facts about what the Yorkshire well, yeah, Yorkshire people wanting to compete against Lancashire with, um, you know, them um, TV soap awards, especially with the the category they have the most sexiest female. What about um, the BBC? They've got theirs. Ah, but this was in the 70s. The BBC had their own imported American TV um farming salt problems didn't they you like the classic um dukes of hazard where daisy duke's always getting kidnapped nearly in every episode but the most famous one of all the soaps was you know with the victoria in it you know that lady was always tormenting and stroking her passing in there it's dallas isn't it right isn't that that proto where she found her husband in the shower and uh, it was all a dream or something yeah that's the one right yeah, yeah, right. She would wipe the floor back in the days with them award things, wouldn't she? You know, for America and that. Well, yeah, but we did have Kathy in Emmerdale. See, now you're making a contest, you Yorkshire fault. Are oh, you yeah, again? What do you mean? You brought it up. No, you interrupt him on the facts about the bloody straw dump in this bloody movie. Well, mentioning the movie, I won't mind watching the movie. Well, you can say I've kept it gorgeous, right? And, you know, I'll come out with serious facts, right? About that um, Straw Dogs movie. That, because it gives the inspiration of the um, ladies being glamorous and all that lot. Since when does Dallas come into it? Well, if you think about it, right? It was all filmed on a ranch and that's something to do with farming, isn't it? And all that lot. And it's all got glamorous women. I mean, America didn't jump on that bandwagon, but the British did, didn't they? Thinking about maybe that's why we got, um, you know, um, Susan um, George doing um, that acting in the in Straw Dogs and all that lot. Why are you going with this theory? Well, think about it, it was the exploitation of ladies, isn't it, in movies? 
Well, maybe this is what they're getting at, isn't it? Can we please get back to the movie? This is getting a very strange conversation. Well, the thing is, it was mine about me using my phone. But, right, the point is, I just found out information. This is a double R movie, right? Now, say if I took my uh, uh, a girlfriend or something, right? And she was a victim of that crime, right, Captain Gorgeous? Now... Would it be suitable for me to take her to see uh, this movie? Because I don't know anything about it. And uh, if you compare it, like you took her to see Straw Dogs or something. I mean, wouldn't you think that is a bit um, not really nice? Since when would you get a girlfriend? I see you getting a bloody insult and again, and I'll soon shut him up. Right, my point is about you, Yorkshire folk, right? How come, right? This will shut him up. You wait for it, Captain Gorgeous. What are you getting at now? You're just annoying me. I'm going to annoy you a lot more now, right? The thing is, right, you know, um, sexiest women was. They notice the Yorkshire women don't win it. I just want to see the movie. Yeah, but the point is, what I'm getting at is that it's always Lancashire women are always winning it, aren't they, on Coronation Street? Look, just shut up, right? He's a well annoyed now, isn't he? Yeah, I'm going to play Emerald Fennell's um, interview, because that's what I'm trying to get my point about. I want to play your interview, you're in the right mood now, aren't you? Well, I don't, I mean, uh, I mean, I, of course, you would hope that the sort of, the, the cultural, sort of political uh, kind of context of the movie changes, of course. I mean, uh, you know, these are conversations, I think, certainly that women have been having for thousands of years. I think only recently have they sort of become public. But honestly, it's not news to anyone I know, regrettably. Um, and I think, you know, in general, this this movie is sort of, it was designed to be a kind of Western. You know, it, it's a, it is a movie about love. It's a movie about you know, taking vengeance on behalf of somebody you love. And in the same way that I think kind of Westerns are timeless, you know, getting getting revenge because somebody hurt you is, <laughs> regrettably, I think as long as we're humans, will be timeless. So she's explaining that that actually is like a glomified, um, pretty um, Western movie then. Is that like to sell to the Americans? Or is that how she did a sales pitch to um, Happy Chappies, you know, and all that lot? Because it still seems like it's a very bit of a story a lot, that Emmerdale farm, isn't it? But really it's for the Americans, isn't it? Because that's done in a ranch, isn't it? What are you getting at? Well, uh, you know, because um, we're all picture cowboys, you know, and all that lot, but Technically, it's like your beloved bloody um, um, Emmerdale, isn't it? And always these ladies want to be working on farms, but they're always dressed up with makeup and all that lot. And um, you don't really see them properly grafting, like, you know, you know cleaning mac and uh, manure and all that. Lot. They're always messing about with horses and um, playing with a bit of farm equipment and all that lot, aren't they? What are you referring at? Well, they don't get into real heavy work, do they? I don't see them mucking out and all that lot. There's all stupid kidnappings and stuff and all that lot. And that is about to be a British soap and all that lot. And that makes sense, right? Even when somebody's like working in the silage pits and stuff like that, they are always got mascara on and always flying with the um, help and all that lot and going around and it's all glamorous with horses and all that. That's all you see him doing is like you know posing over hell bells and all that lot and then trying to let all pretty in that bloody Yorkshire Emmerdale farm malarkey don't it what are you getting at again well that's what I'm trying to get at about that damn song it's meant to be about farming and all that lot and all you've got is like glamorizing women that posing in barns and the juicing men and sleeping around and all that lot. And, um, and then they go to another man having an affair. It all sticks to the same bleeding story all the time, don't it? But other soaps do the same. But now it's because uh, you, 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 you Yorkshire fuck were moaning about you didn't have your own bloody soap. And all they said, is that how bloody it is? Like, it's always like... 
Oh, look, this is how we work on the farm. I've got to pack my mascara on and that how pretty before I go out and do some serious grafting and all that lot. And that's all they're doing is posing like, you know, little, you know, like they're going out on a fashion display, isn't it? Or something. Like they're going down a catwalk. But they're not. They might be doing our grafting on a bloody farm and all that lot. Even when they go to the local village and the local thing, they always got to dress up all over the old tarty and all that lot. Because they're always on the hunt for men, aren't they? Is that what he's getting at? Because I never actually see him really diving into fixing the bloody local tractor or anything, do you? Even Emmerdale, it might have a, um, a mechanic in it, but they're always dressed up now, aren't they? You know, before they get the bloody macky overalls there, they always got to pack the mascara on. What are you trying to get at? Well, it's like I said, everything's got to look so nice and pretty, isn't it? And this movie does it, and oh, even it's on a very serious subject, and that. Isn't that you agree, Captain Gorgeous? Look, I don't want to get you bothered on somebody we're all fighting for because of this movie. Look, I'm going to put another interview on, right? Just to prove what she's trying to get at. It's a bloody western, is it? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I think um, maybe you can talk best to that in terms. I mean, that that was very much the the way that it was first presented to me, and the way that it was sort of steadfastly approached the rest of the way through. And, and I think, uh, well, well, again, you know, it's very spoilery, and so we try not to even kind of mention anything about how, where the story ends sure. and, and or goes, even. But but again, just wanted to make a film that felt honest, yeah. and. The, the ending, like every, you know, the whole movie I think is designed to kind of utilise and subvert the, what we know about genre movies, but, but in a way that feels kind of real. And I think that, you know, the, the, the way that this movie is, I hope, is kind of as close to, you know, for good and bad, it felt like the only, the only thing really, the only route. Right, she's trying to explain. She's a British actress and a director now. But Susan George can easily explain a bloody interview a lot better than she can. In England, one does um, become slightly insulated in one's own world and our own films and what we are doing. And the sort of international marketplace and international stars were all so far away from us, I suppose, in the world that I was caught up in, apart from the likes of James Mason and the people that I'd already worked with, but international stars were not something that you met on an everyday basis or, or knew or came to know. So I didn't really know very much about Dustin Hoffman, apart from the fact that I had seen The Graduate, which I thought he was absolutely sensational in. And I thought he was incredibly sexy and a gorgeous guy. And um, so I really look forward to meeting him. My gut feeling as I met him was that he was tiny. I couldn't get over how small he was in comparison to what I had thought he was going to be. But he was a really sweet man um, with a huge sense of humour that was evident immediately. Uh, sparkle, twinkle in his eyes. Completely, you know, disarming, slightly disarming. Loved that. He loved that. He loved to be disarming and he knew he was. Um, he would take you on and his intention was to make you feel disarmed and he did it very well and I loved it. I responded to that and I enjoyed it. And it was the same thing all the way through the movie. We had a fantastic relationship within the movie, the same thing. And from emotional turmoil and sometimes huge sparks and incredible chemistry, which is what it needed to make this film work, to mammoth laughter of huge proportions that went on for days which he instigated and I responded to. Keep me alone! Will you just leave it alone? I don't understand what you're trying to get at. Well, I think about it. Compare your beloved Emmerdale against um, Coronation Street. Now, that's what I'm thinking about, you know, comparing these double R movies, right? Because yours is class as a double R movie, but Straw Dogs isn't. But technically, it's shad. I think. Well, we don't care. Look, I want to play more of the interview. Maybe you can understand more of the movie. It's only interrupting. Yeah, I'll get back to it, you know. Hello, 
really high. I think I'm really fucking high right now. Well, now where it's going, because it's one of them typical double R movies, isn't it? They always something's going to happen. Like something's going to happen to her right now, isn't there? In this moment, more like something's going to happen to him, but we don't know because you won't shut up. Look, I'm going to put an interview on. All right? Why? It's been so problematic working with Bo. I honestly haven't. Can't remember last time it was a problem laughing at work. You know, I haven't had. I haven't been working on such serious films. I haven't. Um, no, he's ruined so many takes by making me laugh. But he's just so quick, and he will. He'll never do a scene without just adding one other thing in, and it's usually the thing that like just completely ruins me, and then I run. Um, but yeah, he's just great, and it, it and. It's hard to imagine anyone apart from Bo playing that part because the film needs that kind of humour at the centre of it. So, do you understand that with Kerry Mulligan about how she was first introduced with um, her fellow actors and that? Yeah, and that day you're playing your interviews. I think you think I should play my interviews as well, shouldn't I? Who already are you two? Dustin and I had very had a very different work ethic. That was painfully obvious from the moment that we started working together but it was fantastic and that was that was part of the extreme the extreme different way that we worked was part of the magical chemistry i think that came together and ignited and made this fantastic energy between these two individuals because he was most certainly a method actor he always had been he told everyone he, he still is, you know, that's the way he works. He's a method actor. I respect that a thousand percent. It's wonderful. But I am not. I'm ex instinctive. Everything I do is natural, is the first thing I think of. It just is, it's an, I'm instinctive. He's method. Two totally, totally extreme different ways of working. So establishing she's like the same type of actress like um, Carrie Mulligan that she doesn't have to go somewhere and really think about acting she can act on the spot. Well yeah, she's a good actress isn't she? Yeah, Carrie Mulligan is. I don't mean that you idiot! What? What do you mean? Oh, I'm putting another interview on. Oh why are you working on with the movie? Ah oh, shut up! She's just a complete delight all the time. Um, and I remember like a couple of days into filming being like, we should send out a memo to all other directors that you can just be lovely. And pregnant. <laughs> but you can just be lovely all the time and get the job done brilliantly. Um, I just haven't seen her lose her rag. And she's just lovely and uh, really insightful and smart and direct. And she doesn't mess around. Um, and she can give a like perfect note. Um, as soon as you need it, she doesn't ever t cut the camera until she's happy. Um, yeah, I mean, she's literally, and it, it would never in a million years cross your mind that she hadn't directed 15 other films if you didn't know that this is her first feature because she's just completely at home. Personally, I don't think Susan George will be talking nice things like that about, you know, Sam Pettigam's um, the director because he was too busy, you know, sniffing all that um, devil powder, wasn't he? Well, we, we, well, we, well, she did it, babes, anyhow, here is some of it. No, I won't. Well, the very first thing that Peckham Hair did when we began the production, in, in the pre-production of the film, we did rehearsals at the studios. We did two weeks of rehearsal, which was phenomenal, and something that was a really big credit for any major company to give people rehearsal time because that was extremely expensive to bring everyone in to work with Peck and Park and to do rehearsals but we did two weeks which was wonderful in those two weeks we really got to know one another inside out what does she mean by seeing each other inside out well it's one of them double R movies isn't it and you know how violent they are Ugh! look I'm putting another interview on I do think we do women, and particularly now even more so, there feels like this real strength of community between women and we do look out for each other even more so now. Um, and I think, so that's what sort of struck me as being most kind of affecting about the film is this idea of us kind of, yeah, looking after each other a bit more. That interview doesn't seem right, right? Because she's on her own, right? Is she a bit like um, Cynthia Fourth Rock, right? You know, in that uh, undefeatable or something? 
What are you on about? Well, that movie, right? Because you can do all them moves and all that. Because you don't know that Red Mist guy could be like, you know, like that villain what likes ladies in um, flowery dresses, you know. Because um, I got to that bit and I won that YouTube video. Well, we don't care. Yeah, like we want to listen to another interview. No, it's a film. I just hope audiences have a great time. I just think, like, I want audiences to feel the way that I did when I read it, when I got to the end and was sort of gasping for breath, having laughed and cried and been slightly scared. And, you know, I just think, I, I never want to prescribe things. And I've been part of films before that have sort of tough, you know, tackled tough subject matters. But ultimately, you go to see a film to escape and have fun and enjoy. And I just think this is such a... This just has every element of that. It has like a huge romance and it's funny and it's a bit scary and uh, it's dark and wry and um, and beautiful to look at. I mean that actress Susan George, right? She had it really rough, right? It wasn't beautiful like she's explaining because she had to do all that filming in Cornwall. But it's a lot beautiful compared to bloody Yorkshire, isn't it? What are you getting at with that? And yeah, uh, some more interviews. And Peck and Paul then, after the weeks of rehearsal, when we were really working well together, he then made another major decision, which at the time, at 20 years of age, I found a little personal, a little encroaching into my personal space. Because I had a boyfriend who loved me very dearly, and I did him too, and we were about to get engaged. And suddenly Peck and Paul announced that he wanted me to leave by train for Cornwall with Dustin and the writer David Z. Goodman and he wanted me to spend the first two weeks in Cornwall apart from my boyfriend and to live with Dustin not in the same bed or the same bedroom but to live in the same hotel every, to spend every hour with him that I had and it was so clever because it was this relationship in Straw Dogs at the beginning of the movie starts with a marriage that's on the rocks, about to disintegrate. And without the pre-knowledge of how these people had got on in their existing lives together, if we didn't know how they how they came to, how this fallout became, how uncomfortable they had become with one another, if we never knew how comfortable they once were, if that makes sense, there was nothing, there was nothing to build on this relationship. So we had to form a really fantastic relationship, Dustin and I, and then we had to break it down before the film started which Dustin believed in wholeheartedly because, of course, he was method. So this for him was great. For me, I thought, I don't understand why we can't just arrive on the first day of set. And I can't say, well, we've had a great relationship, but now it's on the rocks. <laughs> that, for me, was how it was going to work. But for him and for Peck and Pa, no. We had to live through this, and we had to get there. We had to arrive at this place. And it was a fantastic test of time and patience. See, she would have had it living rough day, you know. Yeah, but um, Carrie Mulligan would have had it rough as well. And I mean, look how she went through her acting career and that. At school, um, we went to the first play I ever did was we. I went to the international school in Dusseldorf and uh, in Germany, and my brother was in a production of The King and I, uh, and I was too young to be in it. They weren't letting my year group in. And we went to go and pick him up from rehearsals one day, my mum and I. And I watched them do a scene on stage and I was distraught that I wasn't allowed to be in it. And um, apparently kicked up a massive fuss and then they sort of bent the rules and let me do it. And that was my first play. Sounds like a right little spoiled little brat always wanting to get around bloody way, don't she? Well, well it worked. got her acting, didn't it? It was Sam Mendes, um, that production, it was Sam Mendes, right, yeah, at the um, at Studio 54, I must have been about 14, and I went with my mum, um, yeah, and that was sort of that, and I saw Kevin Bacon doing a one-man show uh, on that same trip, um, and I saw one other thing, I can't remember, but yeah, that trip, I think, was sort of solid, solidified it for me, um, and I wanted to live in a sort of you know, tiny apartment in New York and tread the boards and, you know, show up to auditions every day and, like, not get the job. And, you know, I really wanted to, like, live their kind of, you know, proper sort of struggling actor dream. What does she mean she wants to be a struggling actor's dream? Well, just listen what the lady says. 
why can't we get back to the movie? Well, I mean, you know, uh, it, in some in some ways hard, in some ways sort of not. You know, I suppose I um, I was very lucky to go to a school where um, you know there was sort of uh, my headmistress was I guess mates with Julian Fellows. Um, who wrote Gosford Park and wrote um, Downton Abbey, and he came. He he'd won the Oscar for Down for for Gosford Park, and he came to our school and he gave a talk on, you know, that. And I met him afterwards um, because I was the head of drama, <laughs> which is I'm still really proud of. Emma Corrin later went to the same school as me. I think she. It seems like she had a stroke of luck in her acting career, done it then. Well, yeah, she did. Well, we're getting back to the movie. Well, in the moment, we'll chat up. It's cr- I don't know. I mean, Gina, Gina sent her my audition tape, um, and she, I think, I, I think she sort of st- provisionally, sort of was like, you know, kind of look, like kind of keeping an eye on me, but not sort of technically looking after me straight away because I literally had done nothing, and then. Before we started shooting Pride and Prejudice, I auditioned for a play at the Royal Court, a Kevin Elliott play, um, and I got that. And then I think after that, we sort of made it official. But I don't really remember. I don't really remember it. I mean, what's so weird, though, is that actually at that time, when I was 18 and just signing with Tor, Emerald Fennell, my now director of Promising Young Woman, was working as her assistant. A year later, we were both in an episode of Trial and Retribution, which we had completely forgotten about, where she kind of pushes me over and we have a fight in a nightclub, and then I go home and get murdered. I think so. I think I also just thought, like, yeah, I'm not, I wasn't good enough. <laughs> you know, I kind of, I remember sitting in the audition, to see those auditions, you have to watch everybody else audition at the same time. And I remember sitting there thinking, like, I'm way better than I am. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't have the goods, and but I also knew there was nothing else I wanted to do, and that it would have been a kind of a waste of time um, and money to go to university and study. Like, I think I was going to go and do English and theatre studies or something like that. You know, and um, so yeah, it was more just like I, there's nothing else I want to do. I can't. I don't have passion for anything else. Um, so, you know, just plugging away. But again, like being in a very lucky position where I could fail and I could then just go back to my parents' house and, you know, um, so that that was sort of a buffer for me. So she seems like she's had a bit of a sheltered life. I wonder why when it comes to her magical arts work soon now. Well, hey, what are you on about? Well, she's going to be fighting the Red Mist soon, isn't she? So she must know some magical arts and that. Well, just listen to more interviews. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. Literally none. Um, but it was, you know, we had, Joe Wright was amazing. We had, we had like, more rehearsals than I've ever had for anything. You know, we had three weeks, three weeks of rehearsals. And it was a whole week just for dancing. Um, where we just did, the, you know, because there were so many dancers in, in the film. So we had a week of dancing and we had about two weeks of rehearsals. And on the first day of rehearsals, Judy Dench... Dame Judy Dench came over to me and I was sort of sitting on my own um, in the rehearsal space and she said, she came over to me and she said, I believe we have the same agent. I'm Judy. Nice to meet you. And I was like, <gasps> just... I was in um, um, the St. Regis Hotel and um, there were a group of people having a meal and this young boy kept looking and kept looking and I saw his father say, just go, just go. And he came up and he said, are you in the James Bond movie. And I said yes, and he went, oh. and that's all he did. Then his mother, his father came up and led him away. <laughs> it was a great effect to have on a man. Yes, that's wonderful. You know, yeah. even though he was 10. Didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and it was just so nice and kind, because I was, you know, no, I was 18 and I'd never been, or, you know, I'd never met a professional actor, let alone, you know, met Judy Depp or been in a film with anyone, you know. So, yeah, I was completely, um, completely out of my depth. And I, and I just sort of attached myself to Jenna Malone, who was incredibly experienced and um, very confident and so much fun. And I just 
decided I was just going to do everything that Jenna did and just copy her, basically. Um, and and Rosamond Pike and Kira and Tallulah and Jenna and I just became, you know, really like sisters. Well, that was nice and sweet, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but it's interesting, though, isn't it? It'd be interesting to watch the movie. I'll shut up again. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, you know, it was really a masterclass, you know, getting to watch Donald and Judy Dench and, you know, Matthew McFadden and Kira and, you know, it was, it was kind of... Um, and I really, you know, there was so little pressure on me. I think there was one scene where I have like three lines and I, you know, I was terrified about my three lines, but, you know, the rest of it really is just sort of, you know, hysterical laughter. Um, but it was, it was like summer camp, you know, I was, and I, and I, you know, it was, we all stayed in hotels together and, you know, we were together for like 11 weeks and no one really went home or went away. It's not like anything else I've really experienced since, you know, um, and in a way, I think it set me up a bit because I was like, oh, this is great. This is what films are like. That's all like this. And actually, you know, we were, it was a sort of very um, kind of romantic um, version of, of what, you know, that of this, what this work can be. Um, but I think, you know, also just being around, you know, someone like Kira who, you know, to, she really was the model of what it is and what it should be to be a leading lady um, on set. And I think just, you know, you learn that kind of stuff as well. You know, you learn what that is. And actually, it's not just having, you know, being number one on the call sheet. It's the way that you are with the crew. It's the way you are with the other actors. It's the way you make people feel comfortable and, you know, welcome. And, you know, she was just such a model for that. Um, and, you know, insanely famous at that point, um, particularly. Um, but, you know, the most normal, down-to-earth, lovely, approachable, non-scary, you know, uh, person. And, yeah, so that was, that was kind of uh, formative as well. This is all quite interesting, but I would like to be watching the movie. Well, I'm going to have to put more on because he's not learning. Oh, because I had the argument. Look, just need more and more. Yeah, I mean, really important. Um, you know, even I spoke to Rose the other day, Rosamund Pike, and she's now, you know, working and living in Prague. And, um, you know, we've both now got kids and, you know, it's all, it's so much has, has changed since we, um, even, you know, when we worked together on education, but, you know, I think it's, um, it's you know, those experiences can be really, really special. And an education certainly was, and Pride and Prejudice obviously was. So, you know, um, it's, you know, when it goes well, it really does feel like you've got a little community. And also it's the kind of relationship I find where it doesn't matter if you don't see each other for a couple of years. Like, there's still, you fall straight back into, you know, the way that your relationship has always been, which is. This is awfully educating, but you're on a power street, you, aren't you? No, I'm not. The thing is, it's very educational. You wanted to know about the stuff about the movie, didn't you? Oh, I like to know about the movie by bloody watching it. And we were like, so, so there's no endorsement, really, of anything that she's doing. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, I, the, the, the reaction that I did have from a couple of people, a couple of journalists, was like, you know, she's crazy. And that really struck me because I did, you know, because I think of all the films where men have gone to much more violent um, and drastic and dramatic lengths for somebody to love, a daughter, a wife, um, and never have I heard them described as crazy. They're, you know, sort of man who's on a mission for his for the person he loves, and that's that's fine. But you know, Cassie does these things that you know that are largely psychological games. Pretty much all are the end of the film, and 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 you know, a, a kind of a couple of people were were sort of questioning her sanity. Um, so that was kind of telling. But I do think. Yeah, I think she's, you know, the means that she's, you know, her methods are totally morally questionable. Um, but, you know, she's 
that she's right. Uh, so are you actually understanding what she's meaning now? She's right about certain stuff and that. Now, oh, oh I'm getting that. You're on a power street, Meg, now, aren't you? Yeah, I think he is. I want to get back to watching the movie. Well, yeah, but he needs to know more about it, doesn't he? What more? Yeah, the method is... is, um, is and, and, but what's great about what Emerald's written, the way that she writes it, is that you see her kind of being held accountable for it just by herself, you know. I think the reaction that she has after she goes into the Dean's office, that scene with Connie Britton, she's in the car afterwards, that's not somebody who's sort of reveling in their victory. That's somebody who feels, like, appalled with themselves. Um, and then she smashes up a car and feels appalled and afraid of herself, you know. So, you know, it, it, she's... She, you're getting to see the, the real impact of, of how futile revenge is and that, you know, even in the moments when she's getting the answer that she wants, even in the moment when the Dean says, you're right, you know, I, I, you're right, okay, is that what you want to hear? You're right. You know, there's a sort of like, there's like an emptiness in the victory. It's like it, it actually, you got it and now it means, it shouldn't, you know, it sort of feels even worse now, actually. Um, and I think that's that's what's so brilliant about the way that Emerald's written it is, the sort of whip smart version is like she sort of sashays away but it's like that's just not that's just not honest that's not you know she is a person who does have a conscience and she's not a sociopath and you know she is feeling deeply throughout so are you establishing more about her character now well i'll tell you what i do establish about your character that you're on an ego trip because you've got more of um, these interviews compared to me isn't it yeah it's an ego trip yeah no it's not look i'm trying to educate you look i put another one on see it again i read the script and met emerald just a little meeting and just felt like i really got along with her and like the script was just super shocking to me and like actually not what i expected even you know a lot of scripts when they kind of maybe movies present themselves as subversive but actually you kind of know the way in which it's going to be subversive and this one was really really surprising um and then i wanted to just meet the person who wrote this and sat down with emerald and she was sort of not what i expected in the best way no not in the best way is it because obviously um what they've got bob berman in it he's not even in this bloody scene yeah, well, we need to know more about the interviews, don't we? About how the, the, you get the feel about the movie. I don't understand. He's, on, he, he, he's like Dustin Hoffman just going on wacko, isn't he? Oh, I wouldn't know. I haven't seen that movie. Oh, bloody neck. The film is about a young woman who is avenging a... Uh, and the injustice that was done to someone close to her on, uh, I think both sort of practically in terms of the men who actually perpetuated it and also globally in sort of the male culture. That was rude interrupting. Well, I put Bob Burnham for him to understand it from a male's perspective. All right, so now I'm just saying I don't understand ladies. Well, no, you don't. So here's some more interviews. It's a you know rom-com thriller, I guess. But I'm the I'm the nice guy that shows up. I'm the good one. I'm the good guy in a world of bad men. So if he's saying he's a good guy, he must be. It's going like um, straw dogs. Then this movie, then is it? So he's the hero. Then is he? Well, no, um, no. Well, why playing interviews like this on it sounds all complicated and all that law. Well, just listen. Ryan went to school with Cassie. They're both in med school. She dropped out and he continued. Then he went on to become a pediatric surgeon. Um, and yeah, I think he's a young, successful, confident person who thinks he's a very good person because I think in general he probably is relatively. Um, and I think he goes, you know, he hasn't seen Cassie in a long time and, and sort of runs into her in this coffee shop and is sort of taken aback by her because I think the sort of vibe and feeling she maybe has now is a little dissimilar to what it was when she was in school. Um, and I think he's genuinely pursuing her um, very earnestly and really has strong feelings for her um, and maybe lacks a little bit of self-awareness in retrospect when he looks back because there were a few red flags, but he's sort of blinded by... 
uh, just the person she is. So with that interview, it makes it quite um, cynically interesting, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, it does. Like it should be like a cliffhanger. What you mean by that? Oh, I think we should move on to a part six because we're not getting any further, are we? So I would like to say thank you for watching if you got so far. What are you saying? Are you ending it now? Yes, I think I should for part six to explain all the other type of movies what might try to imitate this.